Hi, this is Scott Wilkinson, host of Home Theater Geeks. In episode 159, I chat with Stacy Spears and Don Munsell about their new HD benchmark test and setup disc, version 2.0. So stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Home Theater Geeks is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson, recorded May 13th, 2013, episode 159, Spears and Munsell HD Benchmark 2.0. This episode of Home Theater Geeks is brought to you by Pro XPN. ProXPN is a virtual private network that allows you to use the internet the way it should be, anonymous and unfiltered. For 20% off your new account, go to proxpn.com slash twit and use the promo code HTG. And by ManPax, manly goods on a schedule. Get started today and have underwear, socks, toiletries, shaving supplies, and more delivered to your door. Visit manpacks.com slash twit and get $10 off your first order of $30 or more or buy a $50 gift card for 40 bucks. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here, the home theater geek. This week's guest geeks are Stacy Spears and Don Munsell of Spears and Munsell, uh, who have made a new version of their HD benchmark setup and test disc which we're going to be talking about today. Stacy, how you doing? I'm doing good, thank you. Thanks so much for being here. And Don, welcome to the show. Thanks, thanks for having me. Having us. Actually, yeah, yes. Uh, actually, both of you, this is your second time on the show, uh, and I'm so glad to have you back to talk about the uh, new disc. Now, for those of you who are tuned in live at live.twit.tv or logged into the chat room at irc.twit.tv, can post questions for Stacy and Don, and I'll pass along as many as I can. But we do have a lot of ground to cover, so let's get right to it. So we got the new version of HD Benchmark, which has been in the works for quite some time, as I understand it, very highly anticipated. I know everybody on AVS Forum is quivering with excitement, waiting to get their hands on this new thing. Uh, in a general sense, what's, uh, what's new in version two? Uh, Stacy, let's start with you. Uh, well, we've added 3D. So now almost every pattern on the disc will put you into 3D mode. Plus there's also some native stereoscopic patterns. This one has an actual 3D montage shot with Red Epics. Uh, it has audio calibration tones on it. And just, it even includes the kitchen sink. <laughs> literally? <laughs> <laughs> not not literally, I don't think. Unless Stacy stuck <laughs> snuck that on there while I was Maybe there's watching. a photo. Yeah, there's there's some footage yeah. of a kitchen sink in 3D. Yeah. Um, and and uh, I should point out, Stacy, that... It, not, the, every pattern can be viewed in 3D mode, but there is also 2D mode. In fact, the whole disc works on a 2D player and 2D television. Like, you can get plenty out of it even if you don't have 3D. So it's not required to have 3D, but 3D is available. 3D calibration patterns and 3D special 3D patterns. Which is great because um, these are these turn out to be as correct me if I'm wrong. The if you apply 3D or you you play them in 3D mode, the patterns are actually in what's called flat 3D. There isn't really any depth to them. The important point is that you can play them in 3D mode and send them to a 3D TV, which will then respond to them as 3D, so that you can calibrate the or set up at least the uh, TV in 3D mode, which will be different than the setup for 2D mode, right? Typically, yes. Most televisions have uh, a separate 3D, you know, set of memories. So when you're viewing a 3D movie, you know, the, the settings are all different. So if you want to calibrate, you just even brightness, contrast, color tint, that sort of thing, uh, for a 3D movie, it's a completely different set of, uh, of settings than you would for 2D. So you can get your television all perfectly aligned and calibrated and then you start watching a 3d movie and everything's all off again because you're you're back to factory settings so without this without this mode switch uh, you can't really calibrate for 3d mode properly plus there is actually some 3d 
patterns for testing 3D modes and aligning 3D modes and checking 3D modes and things like that. Right, exactly. Um, let's take a look at the menu structure, which uh, was the first thing that struck me as, as being new and I think very, very effective. If we look at the uh, video calibration menu, um, this is the audio, okay, there's the video calibration menu. We can see that uh, this isn't really the part that I'm most interested in, but I wanted to give, give people a sense of, we've got this menu that just has the patterns you need to, to set up your TV with the basic picture controls, the contrast, brightness, color, tint, sharpness. And uh, now we're zooming into that. Those of you who are listening and not watching uh, can't see this, of course, so we'll try and explain what we're looking at as best we can. Uh, and, the, and a getting started guide. Now, I assume that this is for uh, people who might not already be familiar with, with how to set these controls, Stacy, right? Yeah, absolutely. So we wanted some basic text to get people started on how to use or how to set up just the front panel controls. And the front panel controls really aren't on the front panel anymore. <laughs> no. You're, you're dating no. yourself there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but you go in the menu system and you go to the picture menu and, and you'll see these controls, contrast, brightness, color, tint, sharpness, um, as well as color temperature, uh, which you normally wouldn't play with unless you had uh, a colorimeter and, a, and some software and some training, kind of expensive to do a full level calibration, which you can also do with this disc, can you not? Yes, you can. And the color temp in that menu is really just setting the user version where you usually have something like cool, warm, neutral. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And we also, we also name the patterns in this particular menu by the picture control itself. In the advanced section, we actually rename the patterns based on what they're traditionally called. So we kind of yeah. have some of the patterns under two different names. Yeah, yeah, well, that's good. So people can start here and if they don't have a lot of experience with this, they can get their TV tweaked up as as good as can be without a full calibration, full professional calibration. And it'll look quite a bit better than most TVs look coming straight out of the box, right? That's the theory, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, there's there's no guarantee because, of course, you could buy a television that was perfectly calibrated from, you know, the factory in our experience, that is not the common case. That's a pretty um, rare case in my experience. Uh, well, yeah, the television manufacturers, what, what they need to do is sell TVs. This may surprise you, but they are in business. <laughs> it's a cash sort of business. It's a money-making business. So they need, to, they need to sell TVs. And the environment where people tend to view TVs at a, at a big box retailer or something like that, even at Costco, it's banks of TVs all across the wall. And so what they need is for their TV to look different from other TVs, um, hopefully better, you know, so they want to goose things to make their TV stand out. Whereas calibration is intending to make TVs look as close as possible to each other. So the goals of the manufacturer and the goals of the viewer are, are somewhat not aligned in this particular case. You, the, the manufacturer wants their TV to look different and hopefully better than the other ones next to them in the store. And the viewer, or at least the uh, the kind of enthusiast viewer that we're we're uh, trying to reach, they would like their stuff to look like what the director or the director of photography, you know, intended for it to look like. Sorry, I just noticed that my hair looks weird. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> eh, I've got cares? the funny hair. The funny anyway, hair. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah. Anyway, okay. Uh, th th this is a, a very well understood problem uh, amongst enthusiasts, certainly, that we want to have the TV reproduce this, the image as closely as possible to what the content creator intended. And that's what this whole disc, well, most of it is about, is helping viewers who have a TV at home achieve that goal. Now, in addition to video, we also have an audio menu that I wanted to take a quick look at. And here's where we have the first uh, example of this wonderful uh, structure that you guys have developed, which is a two-dimensional structure. On the left, uh, up and down, we have the different main menus, and on the top and across the top are the sub-menus for each particular uh, uh, main menu. So in this case, we're looking at audio calibration, and we're looking at levels, which is the first thing that one would want to set up in uh, their in their home sound system. So not only is this disc useful for video, it's also useful for setting up your sound system. 
Uh, Stacy, tell us what we're looking at here. So this is the menu to set uh, the balance between all the speakers. So you've got your left, uh, center, right, right surround, et cetera. And um, we've also included additional technical details across the top of the menu so that you know what frequency range it covers and the particular dB full scale setting. So for example, on a THX receiver, you always calibrate to 75 dB SPL. But on a lot of the calibration disks, they're designed to, uh, to calibrate for 85 dB SPL. So, and that means it's minus 20. So we made ours minus 30 so that it would closely match a THX receiver. So if you, play, if you set up with your THX receiver and then you verify with our disk, they should be pretty close, if not the same. Mm -hmm. And to, to use this particular menu and functionality of the disk, you would need a, an SPL meter in order to, to measure the levels coming out of the different, uh, different channels, right? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, but you can get one at Radio Shack, a, a pretty inexpensive one for, I don't know, what, 30, 40 bucks, something like that? I think so. I think Something there's one that's. I think there's one that's even cheaper, and I've heard that there's a good little app for Android for your phone. phones or something. Yeah, for phones. Oh, that's true. Yeah, that's also true. Um, uh, I've been looking at some for the iPhone uh, to see what I can get. I'm looking at somewhat more sophisticated ones, but there are simple ones. Some of them are even free. But the audio tones are also available in DTS HDMA and Dolby True HD, as well as 5.1 and 7.1 native. Oh, excellent. So whatever, whatever kind of system you have, this disc will be able to accommodate it. There's so much on this disc. I was going to ask you, is it a single layer or a dual layer Blu-ray? It's a single layer disc, but one of the ways we were able to get so much content on it was most of the test patterns are single frame encodes. They're just one frame long. Mm, on the first and they disc, just loop. Yes. Basically, they set an infinite timer until the user returns to the menu. On the first disc, every test pattern was encoded as one minute running video, even though they were static. So it actually took up more space. A lot more, I would think. Yes. 60 times more. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is delta compression, you know, B frames and P frames and stuff. But yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's true. It's true. Uh, a lot. Yeah, I understand. There's uh, in the compression system, if, if something doesn't change from one frame to the next, the uh, compression sort of discards a lot of the information and can recreate it as long as the as long as the image hasn't changed from one frame to the next. And in these cases, it doesn't change at all. It's identical. Um, the, uh, I wanted to quickly show the video processing menu as well. And we've got one example there. I find this one very useful to evaluate the performance of the video processor in the TV or the Blu-ray player for that matter, uh, because you can set the Blu-ray player to output 1080p. And in some of these cases, the information on the disk is at 1080i, correct? Correct. And on this particular uh, section of the disk, there's both 1080i versions and 480i versions, so standard def and high def. So you can oh, test excellent. both deinterlacing of standard def and then scaling, as well as deinterlacing of high def. Uh, and what we're looking and, at here... And there's a DVD, right? Does the DVD have the telecine patterns on it? or? Yes, it does. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so the, your package comes with a with a true standard def DVD as well as a Blu-ray. Yes, we're calling it a bonus DVD. One of the things we found. So if you want to go back to that menu, you'll see one of the clips. I think it's called uh, PF dash alt. That's the alternating progressive frame problem that existed early on in DVD. So that's only available in standard def. So the asterisk next to it means it's only standard def. But what we found was some Blu-ray players would fail this clip on the Blu-ray, but the same clip on a DVD would pass. So we ended up having to create a standard def DVD to evaluate hmm. a DVD player. Can and you, can you quickly exp I'm sorry. sorry, go ahead, Don. This was kind of done at the last minute, and Stacy put it together. So normally I do know what's on our disc. I, I just, <laughs> <laughs> the DVD, I'm like... Uh, so what's on that thing again? <laughs> uh, Stacy, can you quickly explain what this uh, uh, perf uh, perfect frame or what did you call it? Alternating al progressive frame. I'll let Don Alternating that progressive one. frame problem. Can, can you quickly explain what that is? Uh, I'll um, let Don do that one. <laughs> <laughs> when, oh, golly. We want the, f the really short version. When yeah. the encoder encodes 2-3 uh, pull-down material, which is where you take 24 frames and convert to 60, I'm going to assume that people know how you know, that takes 24 frame film converts to 60 by alternating between two fields and three fields, two, three, two, three, that's two, three pull down, right? Right. Mm -hmm. 
in order to save space, MPEG encoders, in fact, encode it as a progressive frame that says, here, display this for two fields. Then the next progressive frame says, display this for three fields. And the next one, it says, display for two fields, then three fields and two fields. So it saves space that way. They can store the information on the disk as progressive frames with little flags that say, this one, display this one for two, display this one for three, display this one for two, display this one for three. So what would happen is that they would only that there's a flag that they're supposed to set that says this is a progressive frame even though this is an interlaced disk right we're we're really in 60i mode here right for the purposes of compression this frame is progressive let's say so they're supposed to kind of set that all the time but so, there was one specific encoder that on uh, every other frame it would set the progressive flag to true and the other frames would set it to false in essence it would set the progressive flag to true uh, I believe it was only when it had a three field frame and then the two field frames the progressive flag was set to false something along those lines mm -hmm. and it was just a mistake Right. Right. But right. it didn't actually, it's not a mistake that causes that much grief. It, 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 for the most part, most decoders, since they're decoding it interlace anyway, they don't really care that much whether the progressive flag is set or not. But on progressive scan DVD players, some of them were just using that flag to decide whether or not to display things progressive. So when that flag was alternating back and forth, these DVD players would do this horrible strobing where you know it would display one frame nice and crisp and clean and the next frame would be displayed all fuzzy and the next one would be crisp and then fuzzy and it's alternating 24 times a second you know <laughs> crisp fuzzy crisp fuzzy crisp fuzzy crisp fuzzy it was it was awful sounds like uh, uh, sounds like epilepsy inducing to me <laughs> so it, a lot of it's a, so good uh, i was going to say a lot of early disney dvds had this problem so monsters inc had this titanic which is a paramount title also had this so there were a yeah, lot of discs that had suffered from this. On a lot of players, it was actually kind of subtle. So some people didn't really notice it. Some players would look, it was like really, really, you know, yeah, eye, eyeball gouging. It was bad. <laughs> uh, but there were, there were definitely discs and players where it was a little subtle. Like if you knew what to look for, you, you could tell and you would say, oh, wow, this is, this is really something. Um, but but a lot of people didn't notice it at first, and that's part of the reason why it persisted for so long is that people didn't know what was going on. Maybe people noticed that there was this kind of odd flickering or strobing, but it's basically what happened is that the resolution is kind of strobing from low, high, low, high, low, high, low, high, low, high, low, high, and it's going by 24 frames a second, and I don't know. It, 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 it's like, yeah, once you know what to look for and you watch it, you just want to point to things and say, look at, the, look at that tree. It's like going fuzzy, sharp, fuzzy, sharp, fuzzy, sharp, fuzzy, sharp, fuzzy, sharp. And right. once you know what to look for, you would say, oh, wow, that's really distracting. You can't not see it. It's the same as a yeah. rainbow effect for DLP or yeah. the, re the real change markers in the, in the commercial cinemas that are actually yes. showing film, which are disappearing quickly. But right. those that are, you see those black circles or ovals flash in the upper right-hand corner every 20 minutes or so. And, and I can't not see them. Yeah, telling people about this was really the first that Stacy and I, it really ruined people's enjoyment of their, of their <laughs> system. You know, this has been a, a, a trend throughout our whole careers is that we find problems with people's home theater equipment, <laughs> tell them about them, and then they can't not see it. You ruin <laughs> the experience for everybody. <laughs> it's, not, okay. it's not intentional, really. Well, uh, it kind of so is, but I mean, it kind of is, yeah. Well, you want to educate people, and I, I right. do too. Right, yes. Um, SoCal Ray Jr. in the chat room is, is asking, will the patterns be available for the VideoForge pattern generator, or are they just going to be on your disk? To be determined. To be determined. Point. Okay, all right. Um, there was uh, <laughs> Caffeine Free Dave is feeling kind of fuzzy right now. <laughs> um I wanted to also ask you, I wanted to see one more, uh, uh, actually two more uh, uh, menus real quick. One is called Equal Energy Windows. And this is particularly interesting. I think this is the first time uh, on a disc that we've had actual equal energy windows, is it not? Uh, on a commercial disc, that's probably true. There has been some enthusiast discs where enthusiasts have kind of put together a free disc mm -hmm. that I think have had their own version of equal energy. I mean, I think ours, 
are different. But I, I think the idea for equal energy came out of some, some threads on um, the ABS forum. And there are some, there are some you know, free enthusiast discs um, out there. I, you know, they, they, they do exist. But on a, on a commercial disc, you know, on a commercial calibration disc, yeah, I think this, this may well be the first. And why, don't you why don't you explain to us what equal energy windows are? And, and, while, and we can see that you, can, you, ha you have them on the disc at 0%, 10%, 20%, which are the amounts of light coming off the window. We have one example of a, an equal energy window pattern called window 100, which uh, perhaps John can call up as you're explaining to us what the heck, if you zoom out, there it is, uh, what, what is an equal energy window? Well, as you can see, an equal energy window, first off, looks much cooler than windows you might have experienced <laughs> in the past. Well, that's that important. Is, that's super important to know. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like you're looking down a long hallway. Um, oh, yes, indeed. <laughs> no, the, okay, the problem with using windows in general, now, just to back up a little bit, um, a window is a square or rectangle of color or light in the middle of the screen as opposed to a field. A field is the whole screen filled with a particular color or something. Okay. So like if you fill the screen with white, wow, hey, I'm in the middle of the screen. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is an equal energy window with my face in it, which would be uh, not equal energy at all. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, yeah. So a, a window is a small a small piece of the screen, some portion of the screen uh, covered with a particular color. Now, the problem right. with using uh, windows to calibrate a variety of different things is that in real content, the, the whole screen has a variety of colors all over it. You know, it's got real images that are, that are on the screen. And what you're interested in is the interrelationships between the brightest and darkest stuff on the screen. Right, but when you put up, say, a hundred percent window, you've just got that hundred percent window on the screen. And if you compare that to a zero percent window, you've got a zero percent window on the screen. You're comparing not so much the interrelationships of the brightest to the darkest on the same screen. You're comparing them on different screens. And the problem is that both the environment and the display react to what is being displayed on the screen. Uh, a good example of this is plasma display panels. They uh, they can't really display every pixel at full strength, at full power. Um, they they run into power starvation problems. Is my is is the problem there? And so, mm -hmm. as more and more of the screen gets brighter and brighter, they essentially dial down the entire power of the screen. They essentially ride the contrast down in order to keep the total energy on the screen below certain thresholds. And they try to do that subtly so it won't be obvious to the to the viewer. And most of the time, it's not particularly noticeable. But the problem is on a regular window, a 100% window will kick in that brightness limiting. In fact, the brightness limiting is just on all the time. I mean, anything, the brighter the scene is, the more that limiting kicks in. Uh, and, we're talking, a, and we're talking about plasmas here specifically. Plasmas almost always have this ABL or automatic brightness limitation feature. It's, it's kind of like, a, a, you know, the way audio, there's like a audio limiters that'll, that'll keep right. audio from going above a certain volume. This is the same right. kind of thing. The overall brightness of the screen gets limited so that it never goes above a certain level, which would uh, cause problems for the power supply uh, and the, the circuitry. Basically, to keep the power draw below a certain level, it, it automatically sort of scales down the overall screen brightness when there's bright objects on the screen. So if you're comparing a 100% window to a 0% window, the problem is they're not really comparable because there's this extra brightness limiting effect. Now, we so, should say that I think what you're talking about here is a uh, conventional or traditional window, which has a 100% would be full white, 0% would be full black. 20, 30, 40, 50 percent would be the percentage of full white. But it's this window on an otherwise black field. Everything else that, around it is black. Correct. Yes. And so and so what you're saying is that when you as you increase the brightness of that window from zero to 10 to 20 to 30 to 40, all the way up to 100 percent, you're going to run into this plasma limiting problem. Right. And you're not going to get a really a reliable, a good result. Uh, by measuring those. 
Right. You can't compare the brightness of the 100% window to the brightness of, say, the 20% window, and that ratio will not hold uh, all the time. It only holds uh, – it doesn't hold within a scene. So the idea of the equal energy window is to put all of the levels on screen all the time. So it's the same total number of pixels of every level is on the screen. They're just rearranged. So that the 100% in this particular case is in the center, but 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, and 90 are all arranged in these concentric rings around the screen. And they're constructed in such a way that the same total number of pixels are on screen of every level. So when we put up, say, a 30% window, um, I don't know if you can do that, but... If I, you, I don't have that one. Okay, well, never mind. But if there was a 30% window, what you would see is there's 30%... Uh, they're in the center, but the 100% pixels are now available around the edges of the screen. And so then the 30% pixels have been sort of swapped out from the edges to the center. So there's always the same total pixels of every level. And that means that the total energy on screen is the same. The total light spill on the rest of the room is the same. So the amount of splashback you're going to get on the screen is the same. Auto irising systems on projectors will always maintain the same iris while you're measuring. So from our perspective, it's, it's a fundamental improvement on, on windows. Like if we're measuring just about anything, this is just a better way to measure. Mm -hmm. um, it, it really, in the worst case, it has no real negative effect. Um, in the best case, it, it, it has tremendously more, much more positive effect. It allows you to measure things that you really, you know, couldn't measure before and allows you to do things like measure and adjust gamma on a plasma, which for a while was thought to be, you know, almost impossible because, because of this brightness limiting effect meant that you couldn't count on the measurements remaining constant as you increased the window strength. Does Got that it. Yeah. That, that explains it very well. Um, and finally, the last menu I want to take a quick look at is the stereoscopic menu, uh, which has some really nice uh, features to it as well, uh, including uh, crosstalk. Let's see, what, which menu did I choose? I, I see it there on the screen, and it is ah, the visual crosstalk submenu. Thank you very much, John. Uh, so it lets you choose the gamma that you want to use, and we'll explain what gamma is in a minute. And then you can choose a, a pattern that demonstrates or that has in it the ability to actually force crosstalk, which is essentially the left eye seeing what the right eye is supposed to see and vice versa. It's leakage from one eye to the other. Um, Stacy, why don't you explain a little bit about how you put this together? I asked, I told Don I wanted a crosstalk pattern, and boom, he made it happen. Uh, <laughs> That's true. Don, Don is the stereo maven here. Of the two yeah. of you, but it's true. Uh, uh, although this is, this is actually a second version of the pattern. The original had just one eye, and it was centered. But when we started adding up all the combinations of white, red, green, blue, left and right eye, the number of patterns we had to generate to put on disc was just incredible. It's really, really high. And yeah. we, have, and we so, actually have that pattern. Uh, we can show that pattern as well. It's called crosstalk. And, yeah, and since so we're talking about it, I might as well show it. Here it is. We zoom out. We can see. There we go. And so, so the final is... version. Oh, no, go, go ahead. All... So the final version we put together has both eyes and all colors at once on screen. In fact, at the very beginning, the very first crosstalk pattern Don had created, we only had white. And I had a lot of trouble with it. And it turned out that my particular display at the time, the Panasonic VT20, had different amounts of crosstalk depending on the color. So I think for like blue, it had almost no crosstalk, but then it had more for red and more for green. So. Wow. And so um, basically you can put this pattern up. You can put on your glasses. You put the TV in 3D mode, of course. And you can see how much crosstalk you're actually experiencing in each of the three colors and white in, a, in terms of a percentage, like 1% uh, of the right eye image is getting to the left eye and so on. Have I got that right? Yes. Yes. Yeah, that is extremely cool. I got to tell you, but for that uh, pattern to work, you really need to know the gamma of the display, and Don can explain. All okay, of that. so so Don, give us a, a little quick a quick explanation of what gamma is. I'm sorry, I I, I can only give you a long explanation. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, gamma is the curve that describes how 
input levels get converted to output levels on a display. Um, it used to be voltage, now it's just numbers on an HDMI cable, right? So um, if, you, if you think of it, to, just to keep things simple, I'll imagine like a computer monitor, you're, you're feeding it numbers from 0 to 255, right? I think everybody right. understands that. You know, the, like for a particular color, a uh, particular pixel, there's a number that says how strong should this pixel be in red and green and blue, and each of those is a number from 0 to 255, right? right. In video, it's a number from 16 to 254, but whatever. So it's actually... Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the, what, pe what a lot of people don't understand is that that relationship between what number gets put in and how much light comes off the screen is not linear. In other words, if I point a light meter at the screen and I put in, say, uh, you know, 200, I've got level 200 and I measure the light, right? Yep. Then I put up a, a field of level 100 and I measure the light. The measurement will not be half as much. The light is not half as much. When I, when I cut the number in half, I don't cut the light in half. Mm -hmm. And that's because of the gamma curve. The gamma curve is what's called a power curve. Um, it, it's like the input is, um, is raised to a power, and that power is called the gamma number. Gamma curve is a power curve. So like if you say the input value is raised to the power 2, then that would be a gamma of 2. You call that gamma 2, and that means I take the input number, square it, you know, that number to the second power, and then that output is scaled to be between the... the you, you essentially scale the input to be in a range of 0 to 1. You say whatever my peak value is, whether it's 255 or whatever, I call that 1, and I call my minimum value, my black value, I call that 0, so 0 to 1. One interesting thing about a power curve is that 1 to any power is 1, and 0 to any power is 0. So 0 to the power 2 is 0, 1 to the power 2 is 1, but in between, this curve is formed, this, this gamma curve. Um, and that, sh that tells you how the input relates to the output in terms of brightness. Um, and and it's, uh, it's <laughs> explaining why there's gamma and what the hi there's a whole history. Part yeah, we, of it we don't really have time for that, unfortunately. Right, but, <laughs> yeah, but, the but there upshot... is, suffice to say there is a gamma curve that the, the number coming in and the brightness of the light coming out uh, are related by this gamma curve, and it's not linear, as you said. 100 right. comes in, then 200 comes in. The brightness level does not change by a factor of two. Right, exactly. So the, in order to measure crosstalk, you need to know how much light is coming off the screen. And the problem is all we know is the inputs, right? We created this disk. The disk has specific values on the disk that we created, and we know what those values are, but we don't know how your display converts that to light because we don't know what gamma your display is, right? We don't know what gamma your display has when it's in 3D mode. Um, and that will tell us the amount of light. So if we want to say percentage-wise how much crosstalk, how much leakage your display system has or your, the combination of the display and the glasses has, which is it's a whole system, then we have to know how much light is leaking through in an absolute sense. And this is the flaw in most crosstalk patterns is they just give you the numbers. They say they throw up their hands and say, well, we don't know how much light, so... I don't know. We'll just we'll just tell you what numbers we. They'll they'll give you the actual inputs and say, on this display, I can see up to number four, but four in no units at all. It's just four. The gamma, Some arbitrary. You know, it, who knows what it means? Right. It's just four. And then I go to this other display and I three. Okay, three is less than four, so this display is better. <laughs> but it may turn out that the display where you saw three has a much lower gamma. And the result is that the crosstalk appears to be less, but in fact, more light is leaking through. It's just that the relationship of the input numbers to the output numbers on the display is radically different. And so you can't compare those numbers. It becomes a kind of a useless test. You can't say that this display has more or less crosstalk than this other display. So what we did is we said, well, if you know the gamma of your display, then you can input that in essence. You can tell us what the gamma is of the display. Right. And then we can tell you the absolute amount of light that is leaking through. If you don't know what the gamma is of the display, 
you could pick one of them and you're no worse off than one of these other tests. It's just, it won't tell you that much of value in comparison to other displays if you don't know the gammas of the two displays you're comparison, comparing. But um, at least, you know, you can use it. You can sort of find out your display has a lot of leakage or not a lot of leakage, but mm -hmm. um, you kind of do need to know the gamma in order to have a fully accurate, in order to be able to stand behind those numbers and say, this is the amount of leakage mm -hmm. that we're getting from the left eye to the right eye, if that makes sense. It does. It certainly does to me. I hope it does to the audience as well, uh, because it's, it's very useful information for those of us who enjoy 3D, which I certainly do. Um, I know there are people who don't, but, you know, for them, then don't worry about it. Philistines. Um, before we, Philistines. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. Not at all. Not at all. It's all a matter of personal preference. <laughs> Listen, before we, before we go on, I do want to take a moment to thank uh, one of two sponsors for this show. In fact, a new sponsor uh, for Home Theater Geeks, which is Pro XPN, which is a global VPN, virtual private network, that works with almost any internet connection uh, to create a secure, encrypted tunnel through which all of your online data passes back and forth. Virtually any online application can work with ProXPN, including your web browser, email, file sharing, instant messaging programs, all that kind of stuff. ProXPN keeps everything you do online hidden from prying eyes, which is really, really important if you ask me, disguising your physical location and giving you unfettered access to any website or online service, no matter where you live or travel to. Now, you get complete online privacy with 512-bit encryption tunnel. It works via OpenVPN or PPTP. You get to choose. Uh, you can protect yourself against your ISP's six strikes rule, which uh, could be very useful to some. Um, it bypasses internet filtering and blocked websites, uh, bypasses geographical restrictions, makes your internet connection region-free. And uh, they also provide software for Mac and Windows, uh, advanced controls, allowing you to select the programs and ports you want to anonymously route through ProXPN's servers. They also, of course, give you world-class customer support. And Steve Gibson, right here on the Twit Network, gave it a great review on Security Now. So we do encourage you to go to proxpn.com slash twit for more information and to sign up. Pro XPN premium accounts are normally $9.95 a month or $74.95 for an entire year, but we've got a special offer for you. Use the code HTG to receive 20% off the lifetime of your account. That's less than five bucks a month on the yearly plan. If you're not satisfied, you can cancel within seven days for a full refund. So go to proxpn.com slash twit and sign up with the offer code HTG. And we thank ProXPN very much for their support of Home Theater Geeks. Okay, so um, I wanted to take a look at a few of the patterns that, that you have uh, on the disc, of which there are many. Uh, let's take a look, for example, at motion resolution. This is a very interesting uh, pattern that I don't see on many other, uh, many other setup discs. And it has to do with what we were talking about before the show started, actually. Uh, so I hope those of you who were watching in real time uh, were, were listening then because it has to do with how things look on a TV that are in motion. Um, Stacy, can you take us through this? Uh, what, what is this pattern going to show us? Okay, so this pattern is going to show you... Well, we've got six versions of the pattern, I believe. One that moves as fast as 12 pixels per frame, one that moves at 24, and one that moves at 48. So... 12, 24, 48, each one gets faster. And then we have a sine wave version, which I believe is the image you have, and then we have a square wave version. But in the end, you could probably start with the 12 pixel per frame version. And what happens is that resolute, you have these static markers along the screen as reference, and then you have a portion of it that bounces back and forth side to side. So it'll go as slow as zero pixels per frame on the edges, and the fastest speed will be in the middle. So you want to try to find out on your display uh, where you can still see the resolution, resolution as the marker is moving. And one of the tricks you can do to find out if it's uh, display-induced is you can hold your hand in front of your face like this, move your, shake it up and down, and if you see the resolution when you're through your fingers as you're doing that, you know it's caused by the display. And obviously there's different uh, frame interpolation modes. Most of them make the video look like, or make the film look like video, but there's one dark frame insertion or black frame insertion that works pretty well. And exactly. 
And there's other test disks that do have motion resolution. I think uh, Japanese had a couple test disks, FPD, flat panel display. I remember the FPD display disk, which whenever I showed it to anybody, and I've used it a lot, they say, oh, where can I buy that? Well, I had no idea. I don't, don't think you can. Well, on that disk, all of their pattern, all their motion patterns are 1080i. So ours, we went the other direction. We went 1080p, at least for the motion resolution. But then we have a few other motion that we give you in 24p, 30p, and 60i. Hmm. So you can test your well, how your display is doing in terms of motion resolution uh, in in any basically for any type of input signal that you're expecting that you're likely to get. Yes, it's it's very interesting why flat panel displays. Um, have motion blur. Uh, it took me a long time to really understand it. Um, I don't know if you, I mean, I, <laughs> I don't know it. how much time we have left, but. Well, uh, we got about 20 minutes, so uh, uh, don't take all that time, but <laughs> do okay. uh, illuminate. I'll take the, only the 19 max total. Oh, thank you. Okay? Thank you so very yeah. much. <laughs> <laughs> no, the funny thing is, okay, so CRTs actually are very, very flickery. It's not obvious to most people because, um, you know, because of what's called the flicker fusion frequency, like flickering things, once they flicker at a certain speed, you just see it as a continuous light. So most people see a television screen as a fairly continuous light. Some people look at a television screen and it looks very flickery because flicker fusion frequency varies from person to person. But in fact, if you, if you viewed it, if you had the ability to uh, view it in slow motion, or in fact, you, you point a uh, high-speed camera at it and watch it, um, CRTs are very flickery. Uh, most of the time, there is no light coming off the screen. The persistence of vision is in your eyes, not on the screen. You know, the, mm. the, the image does not actually persist on the screen for more than a few milliseconds. It's just that in your eyes, it persists. So the result is that you're actually seeing some of these flashes of images with black in between. It's like a strobe light. So if there's a ball moving across the screen on a CRT, what it really is doing, and, and this, is, this is in reality, this is the world of physics here, not the mm. world of perception. You see, you see ball, 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 right? And your eye is continuously moving. And the point is that your eye moves smoothly, and every time that ball shows up, it shows up on your retina at roughly the same point. Right, you you because your eye is moving continuously and the ball is strobing, it shows up on your retina at, at, at roughly the, right the same point. location on the retina. On the retina, on an LCD display or uh, other display that doesn't have a long black period. Uh, so, like uh, 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 this is true also of DLPs, but also Elcos and so forth, where the image is on the screen all the time. There is no black period. Your eye is still trying to track this object smoothly because it, it images in reality. Your your eye is is evolved to attract to to follow things smoothly. So your eye moves smoothly, but what happens is you have ball, 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 ball. They they essentially substitute for each other. Instead of having a flicker of ball and then blackness bl ball, you have the ball on screen the whole time and your eye is moving and that ball is sliding across your retina the whole time. Mm. And then a new one pops in and in roughly the right place, but then your uh, retina slides, you know, your eye slides across it. And so that image is smearing across your retina during the frame time. So the fact that LCDs have continuous display all the time means that you get a blurred uh, image when things are in motion because your eye is tracking smoothly, but the image is coming up in, in is is the image is um, static in in sections. These, and, but this, and so this is why. Uh, pardon me for interrupting. This is why uh, using what's called black frame insertion that Stacy mentioned earlier. Uh, helps with motion blur on an LCD screen because they are actually inducing more of a flickering effect. Exactly. That's correct. Yes, and the interpolation uh, modes by, doing, by generating 120 frames or 240 frames, it just means the smear is less because the, the image is getting updated more often and as your right. eye slides across it smoothly, you know, it's still being smeared, but it's being smeared a, a sm much smaller amount and so it looks crisper because you've got all these individual images and it, the result is less blur. So you can combat blur by creating more images using the in motion interpolation modes or you can combat blur by inserting black frames. 
And both now, of them pl work. Plasmas uh, do it a little differently. They actually strobe the image onto the screen, uh, I believe, 10 times per frame or so in what are called subfields. Uh, how does that affect, and so the image is on the screen, but not all the time. How does that affect motion blur in terms of this uh, retinal smearing? Well, my experience with plasmas is that they have less smearing, so they must have a, a longer black frame period. I mean, in essence, because they are using a, a phosphor type display, they kind of have to strobe the image. Um, they, they often are advertised as being like 600 megahertz, but that's just marketing foo they're not uh, really 600 hertz is what you meant 600 hertz sorry not megahertz <laughs> that would be fun yeah <laughs> that would be something 600, yeah 600 hertz they're not really displaying 600 individual frames per second that's really sort of a uh they're saying perceptually they are like a display that is 600 megahertz in fact um my understanding hertz. is 600 hertz sorry <laughs> sorry <laughs> I is totally technical is what I is. Let me tell you. <laughs> I done learned my video from the College of Video of <laughs> Bellbrook, Ohio. Um, anyway. Sorry. Yes. So uh, plasma is, is unusual in that the, there's, a, there's quite a bit of flicker, but there's enough dark period to, that, it, that you don't get as much motion smearing. Got it. Um, that, that's the bottom line. I mean, the bottom line is that it, it, it has this characteristic a lot like a CRT, and you just natively don't get as much motion spearing because there is more black period. You get a very bright image. It flashes on for a very brief period of time, and then there's a black period, and then a very bright image, and so forth. Got it. And, the, and this, uh, so what is this motion, uh, uh, motion resolution pattern is, is telling us how much retinal smearing we're, we're, uh, we're experiencing? Is that what really ultimately what we're looking at there? Right. I mean, there, it's, it's showing you how, how sharp the image looks when it's in motion. And it's funny how um, it, when it's moving fairly slowly, it it's often kind of snaps quickly from looking pretty sharp to looking pretty blurry. And it's, it's really interesting because it's a perceptual issue. Um, you'll, it, because it bounces sort of sinusoidally, it bounces... And it's moving fast in the center and then it kind of slows down at the edge and then it goes through the center and slows down at the edge. As it gets close to the edge, often you can see the, the individual lines very clearly. And then as it speeds up, suddenly they just turn blurry. And they're just blurry until they slow down again at the other side and then they get sharp again. And it's funny. It's, it's purely a perceptual issue. As Stacy says... If you wave your hand in front of your face like this, you're essentially doing your own dark frame insertion. It's the poor man's dark frame insertion. If you could keep that up for the whole movie, it would look great. Just it would look great. really great. <laughs> <laughs> not, not really, but but it is, that's exactly what you're doing. Is you're that's essentially you're creating a, a dark frame insertion, and and suddenly things will sharpen up, and even the fast moving stuff will look sharp. That that's what proves to you that it's a perceptual issue, um, in in essence, not I mean, a, a display a, issue. Well, it is a display issue. The display I mean, the, is triggering yeah, yeah, a perceptual yeah. issue for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All yeah. Right. All right. You, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, so I, I just think, I mean, when I understood that, when I really understood how motion blur, what causes motion blur, I, I don't know. I just thought it was, it was fascinating. I mean, it, it, it makes total sense. And suddenly all these characteristics of motion blur that I didn't understand before became clear. It was like the heavens opened and I was like, ah, I have been enlightened. <laughs> oh. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I don't know about you, but I live for that. This is what this is why I do this video stuff. Is I love to just dig in on something like this and go, why is there motion blur on LCD? Why does that happen? I don't, I don't understand LCD. Why should there be motion blur? And I've, I've read a variety of explanations which turn out to be kind of um, wrong, wrong. <laughs> They're just wrong. Not to put um, too fine a point on it. Yeah, Wrong. because this because this is exactly the kind of thing that nobody really talks. You know, engineers who actually work on these technologies, they in many cases they know this stuff, but it's hard to find the the real information sometimes because uh, everything's so superficial. Everything's, you know, it's hard to find the the, the real knowledge. And I feel like Stacy and I, if we bring anything to the table, uh, with our with our video patterns and our and our writing and stuff like that, it's really trying to get into the the deep knowledge, the the how the thing really works under the covers, and then hopefully explain it and 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 make it 
relevant and interesting to people, um, you know, this is what we try to do. I don't, you know, how successful we are, that's, a, that's for somebody else to decide. But um, <laughs> we're extremely successful at it. That's, that's how it is. <laughs> so it seems. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's so probably it to decide. Only if they decide that we're really good. That right. Then, then right. they can decide. Then you'll agree with they, them, yes. 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 <laughs> exactly right. I don't know. <laughs> Um, okay, um, Stacy. Of the other patterns you sent me, uh, which one would would you like to particularly take a look at? Because we are kind of running out of time. Uh, there's ramp. Uh, there's scaling. There's the wedge. There's gamma. What would be scaling. the most interesting? Scaling. That's kind of what scaling. I thought too. Let's take a look yeah. at the scaling uh, diagram or the scaling chart. Here we go. Explain to us what we're looking at and what it's going to tell us when we display it on our TV. So this is one of those patterns that we came up with at the last minute. And by last minute, I mean last July, we actually delivered all the assets to GDMX to, to author the disk for us. And I think we came up with this pattern in December because authoring, was, authoring didn't finish until March. So we had a lot of extra time to come up with new patterns. And this is one of the ones we came up with. People are always wondering, how do you evaluate scaling? Which is, with a synthetic image, is always really difficult. So we tried to come up with characteristics that we thought were important. Now, by so the way, just let, let, make sure we understand. everybody understands that when we're talking about scaling, we're talking about taking an image of one resolution and converting it to an image of a different resolution. So that might be upscaling standard definition to high definition, or it might be scaling from 720p to 1080p. Uh, so anytime you change the resolution of the image, that's a process called scaling. And we want, and this, what this pattern, if, uh, if I'm not mistaken, is able to help us understand exactly how well the scaler is performing its job. Every TV has a scaler. Every Blu-ray player has a scaler. So we want to know how well that scaler is working, and this pattern is going to tell us, right, Stacy? Yes. So the three characteristics we look at, one is ringing. Uh, for long-time scalers, whenever you have a hard edge or a hard transition, they end up ringing, so you get a halo around it. Uh, some of the newer scalers, for example, like the new Oppo 103 Blu-ray player, it has a non-ringing scaler in it. So we have these little black squares uh, that go down the center of the pattern, as well as uh, the various boxes in the pattern. And so if you look at the edge of those, if a scaler rings, you'll see it along the edge. In the case of the Oppo, you don't see any ringing. So that's one aspect. The next aspect is the spiral that you see in the center of each of the little circles. The spiral is looking for something uh, what we call edge adaptive scaling or a post smoothing process. And so far, there are no products on the market today that will actually pass that. I think DVDO showed at CES last year, year before last, their post smoothing algorithm that actually fixes the aliasing that appears when you scale up on the spiral. And then the third aspect we look for is something called linear light scaling. Today, all scalers scale your gamma corrected image. Uh, Don and I have got a scaler that we did in about 2004, I think we received a patent on, that actually scales in linear light. So again, everything today on the market will fail that as well. So of the three tests we have on the pattern, only one of them passes today with current generation equipment. Wow. So we're, you're, we're future-proofed. You, sh you should be able to detect when scalers become available that can pass that last test. Absolutely. And we provide three versions of the pattern on the disk. There's a standard, a 480p version, a 720p version, and a 1080p version. And of course, the 1080p uh, makes sense on 4K displays. And in fact, we had one of the sharp 32-inch displays. And if you compare the internal scaler from 1080p to 4K versus the Oppo, you can actually see artifact differences. So the Oppo won't ring, whereas the built-in sharp does have ringing. And that's one point I want to make sure everybody understands about, about this disk and, and, and others as well. Uh, you can test the scaler, in this case, in the player by setting it up to output the resolution that you want ultimately to get to. Or you can do, test the scaler in the display by sending it the original signal and letting it do the scaling. And you can actually see often differences, as Stacy just mentioned. And you can also test scalers that are in video processors or AV receivers. Right, exactly, exactly. So there are several places in the signal chain where you could have a scaler, and this uh, disk, this pattern in particular, will allow you to test it in each of those places and see which one does the best job. I get this question all the time. Which scaler should I use? Should I let the TV do it? Should I let the player do it? Should I let the AV receiver do it? And I say, try all three and see which one does the better job. I'd, I'd, also, like to point out, I'd also like to point out that this pattern... 
um, is really great to watch while listening to sort of psychedelic music from the 60s <laughs> um, because those spirals actually come in and out. You know, every once in a while it stays static for a few seconds and then the spirals will sort of spiral out and then spiral in so you can look at scalars under motion and the rings spin around slowly. And so it's, it's pretty trippy um, oh, wow, to just man. sit there and watch it. <laughs> Whoa, yeah. there they go. Whoa. <laughs> we should point out, by the way, that uh, Don's uh, shirt today is uh, an excellent example. It should, it should be called the test pattern shirt because it's showing us a beautiful moiré pattern, which we yes. saw also on that, uh, <laughs> on that, dis on that uh, test pattern there. Uh, so, and I appreciate you very much for wearing the, whoa, there you go. That's not quite as evident as close up as that, but you can sort of still see uh, some artifacts happening there. Well, listen, before we get to the last uh, few minutes of the program, I do want to thank uh, the other sponsor for our show, for today's show, which is Man Packs. Now, I've, talk I've talked about Man Packs before. As a guy, which most of us are here uh, in Home Theater Geeks, I'm sure, uh, there's always the basic stuff that you need, you know, and you forget to buy it until it's too late. Uh, and finding good products takes time, you know, underwear, socks, uh, shaving stuff. Not that I use shaving stuff, but a lot of people do. Uh, you need these things every day, but who wants to go shopping for them? Even online, it takes time. It's not something that I like doing, that's for sure. Well, you don't have to. You can go to manpacks.com and get a recurring order for uh, these basic needs that all of us have. Uh, you can join the thousands of men that have already signed up. It's a start it, stop it, change it anytime you want subscription service for getting these basics. Uh, I was surprised to find that they carry the underwear and socks that I wear. So, you know, I ordered from them and it's very easy. It's You don't even have to think about it. You can update your next pack when necessary uh, or just wait for it to come every three months. Uh, every product is tried and guy approved <laughs> by man packs. No duds or junks, uh, junk, just pure win. There's even free shipping and free returns, very easy account management. Um, they always put the customer first. And so it's really quite a good, uh, thing for all of us guys who, let's face it, hate to do this kind of shopping. Now there are two exclusive offers for twit listeners that we're very happy to present. Uh, all you have to do is visit manpacks.com slash twit. You can get $10 off your first order of $30 or, or more or buy a $50 gift card for 40 bucks. So go to manpacks.com slash twit and get started today. And we thank Manpax very much for their support of the Twit Network and Home Theater Geeks. Okay, so now in the last moments of the show, um, it, may, it may be uh, <laughs> a pointless hope, but I was hoping to touch upon the issue of color space. Uh, we mentioned, I, I was on with Joe Kane. Joe Kane was on the show last week, and he mentioned this thing called 444 and 420. And we didn't have time to explain it. We probably don't have time now either. <laughs> but if there's any way that we can at least touch upon the subject, uh, I, I brought, I've got a number of um, diagrams from your website, spearsandmunsell.com, uh, on which there's a great article about this. And I do want to recommend that everybody who's listening go there and check it out. But let's uh, see if we can quickly go through these graphics and explain sort of what... Uh, what this color space thing is. Uh, let's start with the one called RGB. And uh, one of you can take over here and explain what it is we're looking at. Uh, RGB is the basic color space of any display. Um, it, it, breaks a, it breaks a full color image into a red component, a green component, and a blue component. And when those are displayed simultaneously, your eye will see it as a full color image. So all display technologies are based on RGB. All projectors, all CRTs are RGB. All color displays are RGB. Um, and so that's the basic, you know, in order, and also all cameras are based on an RGB sensor. So in essence, imaging, that's the core of imaging is RGB. 
Uh, so if we look at the next short w- version, that's the short version. That's all we all we need right now. Um, then we get to something called four four four, and that's that's written four colon four colon four. So and it's- in video, um, one of the key insights early on was that your eye is more sensitive to brightness changes to essentially the black and white components of the image, the grays and blacks and whites of the image, than the color parts of the image. Uh, it, it's a perceptual thing that we, we, we look for those sharp brightness edges and we're very sensitive to them. But edges and detail in the color portion of the image are not as as important. So in essence, by splitting the image instead of in RGB, which is the obvious way to do it, we generate a brightness image called Y, and then two color difference images, which essentially are what's different between that you start with a Y image and say, there's the brightness image, compare it to the color image and generate these color difference signals, which are purely there just to uh, be able to regenerate the RGB later. Um, the color difference signals can be stored at higher compression because your your eye isn't as it isn't as important to the final image, and JPEG compression, MPEG compression, H.264 compression, essentially all image and video compression is based on this one basic principle of keeping as much detail as possible in the black and white and gray part of the image and losing detail in the color, the chroma part of the image, the color difference part of the image. And the first step to that is to just separate it into a Y image, a brightness image, and then the C and C, C, B and C, R images. And that's 444. I think the explation of what four 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 why it's three fours, that's way too complicated. It's really yeah. We, we won't get into that right now. I think you have that something about that on your on the article on the website. Do you not? Yes. Yes. So okay. So if people want to dig deeper, uh, they can certainly do that. Uh, and so that gives gets you a reduced amount of data that you have to store on a disk, but you can reduce it even farther by going to four two two. And we, let's take a look at that image real quick, and uh, you can tell us what we're looking at here. There it is. So this allows you to just quickly cut the color image uh, storage requirements in half by just literally squeezing the image and making it half as wide. You essentially throw away half of the vertical you know, row, uh, columns of, of data and just you know, make it half as big. Um, that's 422. You still also can compress the chroma images using your, your later compression technologies. You can compress them more strongly, but this is just a first quick pass. It's cheap, it's easy, and it gets you a huge compression benefit right off the bat by just squeezing, by just scaling the chroma information in half in one direction. That's all that's, all that's what that's That's all is. that does. And yeah. then you can squeeze it even farther by going to 420, which, right. in fact, squeezes it then in the vertical direction as well. Right. So in the end, with 420, you have the chroma pictures are one quarter the size, or you know, they're half as big in both width and height, and that saves a lot of space. Then you, can even, then you can go even further by compressing them more heavily, by essentially cranking up the compression ratios, because um, MPEG, JPEG... Um, H.264, they're all scalable compressors, so you can scale the amount of compression, and you can essentially devote more bits to the Y part of the image, the, the luma, the black and white part of the image, the important part, and devote fewer bits to the less important part, the color part. Essentially, if you have a really sharp black and white image with a really roughly sort of sketched in color part of it, your eye says, that's a great image. You know, in fact, if you really kind of analyze it deep down, you may find that colors are kind of bleeding into each other in places. But your eye follows the sharpness of the contours of the black and white part of the image, and your brain just kind of makes it work. So it's a, sh- it's a sorry. Go ahead. It, it's just it's a perceptual thing. You know, uh, chroma resolution is less important than than luma resolution. And so we should 14- say, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say, we want to say that, that Blu-ray, DVD and Blu-ray, surprisingly, both use 420, this most compressed format, to store the data on the disk. And what we hope for, for uh, Ultra HD or 2160p, as Joe Kane likes to call it, is that they'll, they'll uh, relax that a bit and maybe use 422 
or even 444, although I would doubt that. Probably 422, don't you think? Uh, you know, it would be great if they used 444. Um, it would be great if they used 422. I mean, in, in professional video, 422 is about as high as they go. You know, it's very rare that people use 444. It does exist. There are, there are professional video formats that are 444, but a lot of professional video is stored and transmitted and worked on in 422 uh, just because it's such a huge win in terms of uh, storage space and transmission space and stuff. And mostly it works gr pretty well. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. as we all know from watching Blu-rays, they look great, but the chroma resolution is really, really low, and yet the Blu-ray to in total looks very, very good. So looks great. Yeah, and you guys have a you guys have a color space pattern that actually gives you some information about what kind of compression, what which of these it's it's using. We'll take a, just a super quick look at that before we say goodbye. There it was. <laughs> that was a really quick look. <laughs> just a tease. All right, a yeah. little bit more. Thank it, you. It's really much. about what color space you use to transmit between the player and the display. Keep in mind the player, all the bits on the disc are in 420. And the display must display in RGB. Somewhere along the line, it must be converted between these other formats. It has to go to 422 and 444 and then RGB. And so the real question is, who's going to do that conversion? Should the player do it? Should the display do it? Which one is going to do a better job? Some so display just like, just like the, uh, uh, the video processor that we were talking about earlier in terms of scaling, this pattern can be used to show which device is doing the best job of converting 420 back to RGB. Correct. Yes. You also find some displays, and I can feel, and Stacy, you know, is about to leap in and say this, but I'm going to beat him to the punch. <laughs> <laughs> um, some displays only do all their internal processing, like their, the, all the settings internally in, in, the, in the, the display, all the processing. They do it in, say, 422. So if you feed them RGB, even though the display is an RGB display and you're feeding it RGB, they convert it back to 422 what? to do all their internal processing and then to RGB. So if you feed these displays RGB, it does you no good at all. Because they're just going to display it, convert it to 422, process it, and then convert back to RGB. So the maximum that's worth sending into these displays is 422. Above that, you get no benefit whatsoever. And it, it, if it does a really great job, you may not notice any obvious degradation. Um, but if it does, in fact, degrade the video, this pattern will tell you. This pattern will tell you that when you know you turn on, you send your player to RGB, and you're still seeing these 422 style artifacts in the video. Um, that tells you somebody's not doing the right thing, or it it tells you that somewhere along the line the the video is being messed with, messed with in some sense. bad yeah. way. Yes. Well, unfortunately, we have messed with the minds of our viewers quite long enough, and we ha we must say goodbye. It's been a fascinating discussion, and. Uh, the new disc HD Benchmark version 2 is now available on uh, SpearsAndMunsell.com and, and uh, elsewhere, Amazon probably, right? Yeah, we have a dealer section where we list all the local, uh, the U.S. dealers as well as international dealers now. Fantastic. And Very highly recommended. I've, I've uh, seen it. I intend to use it. It's, uh, I've used your version 1 disc for many years and... Really, really happy to see the, this one come out. I want to thank you both for being on the show. Uh, Stacy Spears, thanks so much. And thank you for having us. You bet. And Don, thank you. A pleasure. Absolutely. Always happy to have you here, and I hope you will come back and uh, explain more about the wonderful world of video. <laughs> <laughs> you can always find me at uh, avsforum.com, uh, and you can email me at scott at twit.tv, and you can follow me on Twitter at htgeekscott. Uh, you can also find previous episodes of Home Theater Geeks at twit.tv slash htg or our new YouTube channel, youtube.com slash twit home theater geeks. Next week, my guest geek is scheduled to be Kevin Miller, a calibrator extraordinaire who participated in last weekend's flat panel shootout at Value Electronics in Scarsdale, New York, the ninth annual flat panel shootout, by the way, in which we uh, they took a look at the Panasonic ZT60, VT60, uh, and last year's VT50, I believe, among several others, along with a Pioneer Kuro. So uh, that's going to be fascinating, and I do hope you will join me then. Until then, geek out! <laughs>